Welcome to Holy Cross. Glad you joined us this morning. Please join me in singing our opening song. everybody. Make sure you take a look at your crosstalk, especially the announcement on the front page about the Fall Fest and uh, things like that. And I've got a new sermon series starting next week, and you can read about that on the front page. John Braun, Jonathan has an announcement. Morning. So we have a trunk or treat on October 15th from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Uh, we still need some trunks and I think about four or five more would be great. Uh, the reason for that is because we, last year we had a lot of people come from the community, especially in Bryan, uh, down here for our trunk or treat. So this is a great opportunity to uh, share the Lord with people and also invite people into College Station, especially Holy Cross. And so if you have a trunk and you have a decorative ability and an ability to play games with kids, this is the ministry for you and we would love to see you be a part of that. Uh, and then my second announcement is the mission trip funds are due today uh, because we're going to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and we have a large group. We want to make sure we're ahead of everything. So on, on your uh, check or whatever, mention Holy Cross on the memo, uh, mention mission trip, and we'll be able to make sure you are documented for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Good job. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Steve, I think that's you. <laughs> this is amazing grace. All right, 
rise, everybody. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in all and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, oh, oh Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We're going to look at 25 to 32. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I gave an account of my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Cause me to understand the way of your precepts that I may meditate on your wonderful deeds. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me and teach me your law. I have chosen the way of the faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Here ends our first reading. As we do every Sunday, we're going to do again now. We're going to have an opportunity to confess our sins and delay our hearts and our souls before the Father in heaven. Take a time to reflect your sins as I pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to gather to hear your word and to call upon you in prayer and praise. We're also here to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in this great close fellowship that we have. We consider our unworthiness. We also confess before you and to one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and we cannot, on our own power, free ourselves from our sinful condition. Forgive our sins, have mercy upon us, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and in his stead you are forgiven, 
As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. chapter. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and also sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And also a reading from Mark, the ninth chapter. This is uh, concerning our sermon to come. They left that place and passed through Galilee. 
Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. That's our gospel from the book of Mark, the ninth chapter. Let's all rise as we profess, as we do every week here in church. One of the creeds, or one of the three creeds, today is the apostles. We profess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
no shadow you will light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Snow wall you won't kick down A lie you won't tear down Coming after me and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior. His name, of course, is Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, just a reminder, we are going to be starting a new sermon series next week, and the title is You Are Not Alone. Next week in life, you're not alone, and persecutions on the 16th, and how Jesus fights our battles, the 23rd, and sorrow and death, you promise eternal life. Then we're going to end it on Reformation Sunday. And sin, you justify me. All right? So remember and reminder that we have one worship service on Reformation Sunday, and then we have a big fall fest afterward, dinner, and all kinds of great, great fun. Well, good. Responsibility, a significant lifestyle. I've really been, in the past several months, hitting two main themes. And that is standing firm in our world, standing firm in in, in society, and how important that is, especially amidst what it seems like tremendous persecution. Um, As I said last week, things things have gotten really weird around our world and in our nation, and it's almost like the non-Christians have made it into a very strategic art form and how they communicate evil to us and how we don't want to get caught up in that. So you stand firm. And then number two is really pushing missions and outreach because we're going to be taking this church in a completely new direction and how outreach and missions because it's going to be the picture here. So here's a question for you. What drives you? What is it? What is it that really lights your fire? What do you chase? What is your thing? What is it? You know, I personally have a chase, and I personally have a dream. And I know that each one of you has the same thing, whatever it it might be. You know, the older I get, the more my body doesn't want to do what it used to do. Have you noticed that as you get older? It just doesn't do what it used to do. For example, and I hadn't even told my wife this, yesterday morning we had a long night, Friday night, we stayed up too late, and that's all right, you had a, had a good time staying up late, but then you got to get up the next day. On Saturday morning yesterday, I went to get my coffee, and I put it underneath a soap dispenser, <laughs> and I put two squirts of soap in my cup. And, and then it just dawned on me, I said, that's not going to work. I may get some kind of a irritable feeling in my digestive system if I drink this. We don't want to go on about that. We've all been there. But the older you get, whether your brain goes a little bit or your body goes a little bit, you know, um, you, you really start to hone in. And I wish I would have done this when I was younger, when I was in college, let's say. When I was in college, man, 
footloose and fancy free. I didn't have a care in the world. The only thing I cared about was, am I going to pass the test tomorrow that I did not study for tonight? But you want your life to count, and you want your life to have meaning. Because we don't want to be just a blip on the screen, and what I do is I picture myself, and everybody has their thing, I picture myself laying on my deathbed or maybe in a coffin, and it's a reality check. Not that that's negative. We're all going to die, okay? But I want to make a contribution. I really do. Because God has given us a playground that we call the earth, and we have a good time on this earth. We've also been told by Jesus Christ that we need to make this time count. The same is true of all of us. You want your life to count. And you don't want your life wasted, I'm assuming. And so there's this scream inside of us. And I call that scream the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. It's this scream inside of us that says, and I'll use myself as a first person illustration, Mike, there is more. There's more to this life than what you think there is. There's always more. We never have it all figured out. And the good news is the Spirit's right. The good news is the faith that the Spirit instills into us and the reminders that the Spirit continue to give, He's right. There is so much more. Matter of fact, the Bible says there's more than you can ever imagine. When God walked on this earth as Jesus Christ, he taught that significance was not tied to wealth and to things. Now, there's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with things at all. But the significance in life is wrapped up in a package. It's in, in, in it's a radical package. The radical package, if you unwrap it according to the Bible, is service. Service. Now, is anybody else here disappointed in that? I think we all are disappointed in that every now and then. At times, we don't like that word, service. But Jesus told us throughout the narratives that the recipe for greatness is service. It's doing now, if I were God in my fallible, sinful, wretched condition, I probably would have picked something else besides service. The recipe for greatness depends on how your lawn looks. You know? The recipe for greatness is how, how clean you can keep your garage. Okay? Or for my wife, the recipe for greatness would be how many shoes you can acquire. She'd be great. Great in the man's eyes. But the route to significance is paved in service. So what I want to do for a few more moments is I want to take a tour, or, or a tour, however you want to say it, through the Bible and to see what Jesus says about greatness and the life teachings of Jesus. All right, so there's four points we're going to get after him right now. Number one. Jesus served other people's agendas. You see, Jesus was always about praying and helping and healing and stopping. Have you noticed how Jesus just stopped? He stopped at a home. He stopped at a well. He stopped at a tomb. He stopped and he healed and he prayed. He just stopped. And he was putting other people's agendas above his own. What a great example that is for us. Now, we know that we cannot at all be Jesus Christ. We're not perfect. But he gave us a great example for us to emulate. Because that, that's our goal, right? Number two, Jesus taught about serving. The famous passage is Mark 9. You just heard it a few moments ago about Jesus and his disciples, his closest followers. 
9, 33 to 35. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down. All right, what did he do? He took time. He called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be the last of all and the servant of all. So Jesus' closest friends, his closest followers, were having this, what I'm assuming is a childlike spat, an argument. One of them probably said, and I can see, is probably Peter. I'm the greatest. John probably said, no, you're not. You're an idiot. Something like that. Yeah, I am. No, you're not. And they were having a spat. Who's the greatest? And then Jesus probably says, hush. Sit down. And he ties greatness to serving. All right? Leads us to point three. Jesus uses parables and stories to illustrate serving. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you don't even have to know who God is. You don't even have to know anything about the church to know about or have heard about the parable, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's taught all around the world. And if you were to read Luke, the 10th chapter, it almost sounds like the beginning of a 21st century joke, okay? Okay. Hey, you want to hear a good joke? There's a priest, there's a Jew, and there's a despised Samaritan, all right? Well, there was a teacher of the law. Let's just call him a lawyer. Teacher of the law. Who asked Jesus a question. What do I got to do? And if you know anything about this story, the man that Jesus is talking about had been beaten up and robbed, so the guy is just laying there. And in walks this priest, walks right by him. Here comes a Jew, walks right by him. These were the hoity-toity people, all right? The people who said, we got it all together. But then here walks this despised Samaritan. Luke 10, 33 and 34. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. This is the wounded guy. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn. What did he do? He took care of him. And then Jesus goes on to explain, and he asked the guy the question, well, what do you think? What made this man good? And the teacher of the law says he saw a need and he met it. And Jesus says, exactly right. Now you go and do likewise. That's serving. Number four. I'm going to spend the rest of the sermon on this one. Jesus models service. You know, you go to the final hours of Jesus. Now listen closely. You go to the final hours of Jesus. Thursday night, Friday night, okay, those nights. And he's about ready to be crucified. I mean, Thursday night, he comes together with his disciples. He pulls all these guys together. These are his best friends. These are his buddies. And they have one last final meal. And then he does this, John 13, 4 and 15. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, I want to camp right there for just a minute. This feet washing thing always kind of rattles my cage a little bit. You see, feet washing was not an unusual practice back then, but it was meant for the servants and the slaves. That's what they did. It was highly unusual for a teacher or a respected leader, and especially now God in flesh, to wash feet. I mean, of all the things, Thursday night, time draws near, time is coming to an end, gathered around the supper with his closest friends, why feet? I mean, feet, think about it, they're nasty. They're nasty. I don't even like washing my, I don't even wash my own feet. I let the water 
go from my head down to my feet, and I figure they will wash themselves. <laughs> Think about present times. We've got fragrances. We've got odor eaters. But, but, but feet still stink. Rewind the clock 2,000 years, there's no sidewalks, there's no manicured lawns, there's no homeowner, HOA or homeowners association ripping you off and making it nice for you to walk around your glorious, glamorous neighborhood. It was dirt, it was camel, donkey, oxen, manure, dung, whatever else you want to call it, it was dirt. It was walking around and all that stuff. And Jesus walks up to his disciples and said, I'm going to wash your feet. Now we would say something like, why not just, Jesus, why not just brush their hair? How about that? Or Jesus, why don't you just open the door for them, okay? And then call it a day. And then tell them, go and brush people's hair and open the door for them and do likewise. You know why he didn't use those things? Because those things aren't enough. That's simple. That's easy. It was way too easy. It was way too simple. Because if you wash somebody's feet, that's big. We went to a wedding. When was that? A long time ago. And there were the bride. There's the bride and there's the groom. Let me, let me get it right. The bride and the groom. It wasn't here. We were spectators. It was a great, a great honor just to be a spectator. And the very end of the wedding service, they took off each other's shoes, the bride and the groom, and they washed each other's feet. And I, I, I couldn't, I was like, and I turned to my wife and I said, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> that's strange. You know, if I were to bring up a bucket and a sponge right now, would anybody here feel comfortable if, if you took off your shoes just right here and I washed your feet? Who wants to do that? Not a chance. Now you think about it. It's one of Jesus' last messages. And he said, guys, I'm going to leave. I'm going to be gone. You've heard me for three years. You've walked with me for three years. We've eaten together for three years. You've seen everything I've done. I've done miracles. I've, I've spoken parables, all these things for three years. I am going to send you right now home with the greatest object lesson I can give you. And he drove home the point even deeper when later he hangs on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. He hangs there. And he said, this is the ultimate gift. This is what it's all about. And it was the main idea. You can't escape this if you study it. We see Jesus hanging on a cross. We can vividly with our minds see that. We can see blood dripping from his head and his hands and his feet from his side. We can see all that. And then we acknowledge in faith because the Spirit says there's something greater. The Spirit pierces our soul and said, there's a servant, Jesus Christ, who forgives the sins of mankind. Now, in appreciation for that, you go and serve people. The last object lesson he gives is the crucifixion. But the one before that was, be a servant to all. He's pretty much telling his disciples, you're going to see something greater tomorrow. But I want to preface this by saying you better be a servant. You see, you can't escape that if you open the Bible and you study that. You can't escape the entire fact that this is extreme love showed by Jesus Christ. You cannot escape the fact that the primary challenge that we have in life is gratitude for a sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You can't escape that fact. You see, you're never more like Jesus than when you serve. Put that on your refrigerator. 
You're never more like Jesus than when you serve. But you say it's so difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. I don't like doing it every now and then. I'm looking around. There was a, we had a guy who came in off, off the street after first service. I don't see him here. But somebody came up after first service and said, there's a guy out here who needs to talk to you. And he sat right, he was, he was standing out there crying. And I was really encouraged by the members of Holy Cross who sheltered him. Because you're never more like Jesus than when you serve. But it's difficult. And I'm going to use myself as a per, first person illustration. It's difficult because I like my time. I like being selfish. I like my pride. I'm not the most humble person in the world. I'm lazy a lot of the time. And I like to put myself first. Does that explain it? Describe any of you in here today? I'll tell you why it's so hard not to serve. It's because it's much nicer to be served than to serve. You know, we're all, listen, we're all running for president of our own fan club. Have you ever noticed that? And we're not going to drop out of the race anytime soon. I like me. I like me a lot. I like you. But I like me more than I like you. Isn't that how we act? You see, until we admit that we're sinners, which we do every Sunday in this church, until we are willing to literally fall on our knees and profess our allegiance and our gratitude to Jesus Christ in humble contrition and repentance, you cannot be open for change. You know, the Bible talks about serving. And the Bible doesn't just talk about writing a check and you're done. Now, there's nothing wrong with We, we want you to believe me. We want you to write checks. We need to keep the church running, and, and we send offering all over the place. But, you know, I, I'll admit, it's so easy in missions and outreach just to write a check, rip it out of the checkbook, and hand it in and say, I'm done. Amen to that? How many of us have done that? Me. I've done that. It's so easy to be asked, well, uh, we'd like for you in this mission and outreach opportunity to uh, bake some chocolate chip cookies. You put them in the oven. Take them out, eat a few before you bring them up, put them on a plate, put some saran wrap around them, throw them in a classroom and go, I'm done. Are we guilty of that? I don't cook, but I'm guilty of doing a whole lot of other junk like that. Is that good to give cookies and to write checks? Amen. You better. It's great. But that's not where it stops. Serving is your total lifestyle. It is the catalyst. It is the picture in what you do. It flows out of you. It is your character. It is your lifestyle. And it's not something that you do just one hour a week to appease your own gratification. It's who you are. And it's not done out of obligation, but out of desire and a lifestyle. Years ago, someone came to me and said, I don't give offering unless I like the sermon. I said, you know what I said? I, I, I don't want your money. Church doesn't want that money. You get out of gratitude, not out of an obligation. I pass this on to you today for you to understand the vital importance of what this is all about and the vital importance of the direction we're heading in this church. We're outreach and mission driven in this church, but we're heading in a completely different direction. And we're going to explain that thoroughly to you at our November voters meeting. Because we need to know what is vitally important. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. of which We are number one. And then Jesus says to serve. How many of you today think you can go out and do that this week? I pray you can. All right? Let's all do it together. Let's all rise for prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this great opportunity. Not only, Heavenly Father, did you get us out of bed today and 
our feet hit the floor. And now we can say there's another day. But you got us to church, and we don't want to be the same when we walk out of here today. So thank you for this great love letter called the Bible that we can learn from and be challenged from and figure out how we can serve and live. It's your way. Gratitude to you. In the silence of our soul, we admit our selfishness, we admit our sin, we admit our desire for convenience to obey what you have called us to do. So God, now we pray, we ask for the courage that we would take this opportunity as the Bible directs us, as the Spirit infuses us, as we're motivated by the gospel to see this through that we're going to serve, and that you would mold us into your likeness and so that our lives would be marred not by a pursuit of success, but a desire for significance, our responsibility. Heavenly Father, right now we also are mindful of the hurricane victims over in Florida and South Carolina, North Carolina. We ask that you would continue to uh, be with them, to lift them up. There have been churches that have been decimated by wind and flood. Uh, remind them of your grace and remind them that, that your son, Jesus Christ, came to preserve and that you are the great physician. So be with them, protect them, be with those who are supporting their, their needs. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen. We continue with the rite of friendship. You may be seated. We continue with the rite of friendship and the gathering of our offering.
Jesus has come and he is here. Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my true body has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he also took the cup after supper. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink. This is my true blood. It has been shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The prayer our Lord has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. However you feel comfortable, greet those around us, or around you in the Lord's peace. You may be seated. the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb, in the 
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages steps down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living home then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion the grief has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. My living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope, God, you are my living
clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. In darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. And age to Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ continue to strengthen you and also preserve you now and into eternity. Remember your sins are forgiven. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. to 
the world light into my life i will live for you alone you're the one i see knowing i will find all i need in you alone in you alone where you go i'll go where you stay i'll stay when you move i'll move i will follow you whom you love i'll love how you serve i'll serve if this life i lose i will follow you Follow you, yeah. In you there's life everlasting. In you there's freedom for my soul. In you there's joy, unending joy. And I will follow where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. You love, I love, how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I love, how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Go in peace, serve the Lord, and have a great week.